Tonight, um, I want to talk to you about reality within kingdom love. Reality within kingdom love. If you have your uh, hard copy of Bible or your digital instrument, go ahead and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1, but it's important that you follow along. I'm going to help you tonight with some Bible reading. We're going to read a whole chapter, so you can almost maybe check off something on your... <laughs> On your uh, Bible reading plan, we're going to read Ephesians 1, uh, the whole chapter. And I'm going to give you a focal point as we read. So before I take off in this, um, I want to go ahead and define one word. And I want you to see this word as we read through Ephesians chapter 1. So we're going to be looking for the word in. In. All right? Everybody say in. in. So we know what, we're, what word we're looking for, okay? I'm reading from the New King James Version. I do want to define this. The word in means this. It denotes a fixed position. A fixed position in place, time, or state. It also means of those with whom someone is in near connection. An intimate union. One not, oneness in mind, heart, and purpose. So when we are in something... There, that means there's an intimate connection, intimate union. There's oneness in heart, mind, and purpose. And we're in a fixed position when you're in something. Say in. in. So let's launch out from Ephesians chapter 1. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has bless, blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the Beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he has made uh, abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth in him. In him, we also have obtained inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him, who works out all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him, you also, after you trusted, heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love for all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of our understanding being enlightened, that we may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. He's put all things under his feet. And gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. I want to key in on to launch out on Ephesians chapter one, verse number seven. It's one of the verses that we read within that chapter. It says, in whom, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his, of his grace. Thank God we are redeemed. Thank God for the blood that's on the mercy seat. Redemption is deliverance from the penalty of sin and transgression. Redemption is the recalling of captives and sinners from captivity. 
through the payment of the ransom, the death of Christ was the ransom, what Christ paid to release us from slavery of sin. There's deliverance in redemption. There's freedom in, de- in redemption. Jesus paid the ransom for us. A ransom is money or the price that is paid to redeem a prisoner or slave for goods captured by an enemy. And he can restore us to liberty and to the original owner. Amen? We are redeemed. Say, I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed. Say, I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed. Redeemed means you've been bought back. What Adam lost through disobedience in the fall and death passed to all men, there had to be a payment made. And on our own merit, on our own works, on our own effort, we could not match that payment for eternal life or relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. There's only one person who could have paid that price and who did pay that price to liberate us. Listen, we were in shackles because the Bible says whatever you uh, has dominion over you is what you're slave to. If you go to Romans chapter six, and when you're in unrighteousness, you're a slave to unrighteousness because you don't have the nature. It hasn't been released or regenerated or born again to serve the Christ. And so a payment had to be made, and that payment was made through Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to give you a few scriptures just to back this up. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses, uh, verses 18 and 19, it says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, doesn't matter how much money you have in the earth or how much means you have in the earth, you cannot with that means buy your way out of slavery and sin. You are not redeemed with corruptible things, but we are redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish and without spot. Galatians chapter 3, verse number 13. Galatians chapter 3, verse number 13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having became a curse for us, for it is written, curse is everyone who hangs on a tree. He took on the curse for us, And now we're blessed. Say, I'm blessed because of Jesus. Say, I'm blessed because of Jesus. Because of his payment, the curse has been released. He freed us from the penalty of sin and the power of sin. I'll say it again. He released us from the penalty of sin. And his blood also released us from the power of sin. As a new creation believer, you don't have to be dominated by sin. You can live a holy life set apart to God. Let me say it. You should. You should. You should. You should be grateful every day when you wake up. That his blood is on the mercy seat. If Cain's blood speaks from the ground... How much more does Jesus' blood still speak today? It says free, delivered, healed, whole. We were guilty. We were guilty. Death passed on to all men. And we had the sentence upon us. It's just like in the natural, somebody committed murder. There is a penalty according to our laws within this country. Correct? And you go before a judge and that judge determines a sentence. It could be life. It could be the death penalty. But whoever committed that crime, they found them guilty because of the verdict, right? The facts, the circumstances that actually took place. And the only way they're going to get out, though... Naturally speaking, if somebody could take their place. And that's what Jesus did. It was like we were in prison for life. We're on death row. And Jesus said, listen, I'm going to come into the prison for you. I'm going to open the gate because the price had to be paid. God just didn't wink at it, just didn't excuse it, just didn't let it go. He sent his son and said, I'm going to satisfy justice. Because nobody deserved to die. Somebody died. Now that there's got to be, the penalty's got to be passed on to somebody. So every morning when you wake up, you can think, man, he set me free. I was in 
prison, so to speak, in slavery, but he opened up the door and I can come out and I can live for him. So legally, we've been redeemed. Colossians chapter 1, verses number 14 says, in whom Jesus, this is from the Amplified Bible, in whom we have redemption because of his sacrifice, resulting in the forgiveness of sins and the cancellation of sin's penalty. He forgave sin, but also canceled the penalty of sin. So because of the redemption, the blood of Christ will redeem from the power and penalty of sin. And now we can live before him in a holy, righteous, pleasing, obedient way that glorifies his name. In Galatians chapter 4, verse number 5, the word says this, Jesus redeemed those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. He redeemed those that were under the law that we may be adopted as sons. Not only did he redeem us from the penalty of sin, the power of the sin, not only did he justify us and impute his nature to us, but he also positioned us to be a son and daughter of the king. Oh, if we could get a hold of this as a church body. Some think it's good enough that he just paid for the penalty of sin. Others understand that he's releasing me from the power of sin, but he's also positioned me because of his redemption to be a son or a daughter of the king. I think our prayer needs to be, Father, help me to think like the son or daughter of a king. Get me out of stinking thinking, <laughs> slavery mentality. I'm not a victim. I'm not a victim. Hallelujah. I'm not from the wrong side of the tracks. <laughs> I have the DNA of the Lord Jesus Christ on the inside of me. I have the genealogy of a thoroughbred, <laughs> a champion of all champions. I'm in the bloodline of Christ. Whatever my heritage was before, it ceased, and now I'm in, in his line, in his genealogy, and I can take his name. I'm in Christ. I'm positioned. I'm in intimate union with him. I'm near to him. I'm in oneness of mind, heart, and purpose. That's the legal side of being in him. Legally speaking, you've been redeemed. Legally speaking, the penalty has been paid. Legally speaking, the power of sin has been broken over your life. Legally speaking, you've been positioned and destined to be adopted as a child of the king. But are you living it out vitally? Because there is a legal side and there's a vital side. There's a legal side and there's a vital side. And the vital side means there's actually life. You're actually experiencing the truth of the word of God. Let me give you this example. In a marriage covenant, legally, you could be wed. Legally, you could be married. Legally, if you're a man in the kingdom, hallelujah, in the kingdom, if you're born a man, you marry a woman that was born a woman. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> and le that's legal in the kingdom of God, right? And she could take your name, so legally you've been wed, but vitally is there life in that relationship. I'll put it this way, you can have a relationship, but vitally you may not be having some fellowship. Let me put it this way. Legally, you could have a house, but vitally, you don't have a home. Because you're not in the word and vitally applying it to your life. I'll say it this way. You're not experiencing God's best because you're not actually staying in. Don't vacillate. Don't straddle the fence. At a men's meeting, I'd say, if you straddle the fence and you fall, that would hurt. <laughs> Hallelujah. In Revelation, he said, don't be lukewarm. Be all in. Be hot for Christ. 
right? On a, on a team, a sports team, or even on a work team, you could be legally employed, you could be legally on a team, right? But you may not have all the buy-in vitally. Some of the best teams that have gone on sports teams to um, accomplish the most in the year have a thing called chemistry or buy-in. And some of the worst teams, even though they're legally on the team, they're not all in vitally. And they're more about themselves than they are about the team. And therefore, they're not experiencing the success that they should be having. So my goal tonight is to bring the legal side and the vital side and have us walk this thing out all in. Because this is in Christ realities. In Christ realities. There are so many in Christ realities. I'm just going to hone in on one tonight that's going to be saying in love. But I could talk about being in confession, in forgiveness, right? In meditation, in giving. I could talk about all these different in Christ realities. Are you doing them vitally even though the legal side's already there? Because he came to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. Legally, that's done. Now, vitally, if you want to experience it, you better learn how to walk it out. Elbow your neighbor and say, walk it out. Elbow the one on the other side and say, walk it out. So these are in Christ realities, and truth and reality are synonymous. Reality means the state of things as they actually exist. You know, reality shows are not reality. I'll say it again. Reality TV shows are not reality. Something happens when they turn on that camera. It's not reality. It's called a show, a put on. Amen. So reality is a state of things as they actually exist or what actually happened or what the actual situation is. It means real. So truth and reality are synonymous. Real means it's true. It's genuine. It's not artificial. It's not genetically modified. I'll go to Romans 1, which my wife has quoted this several times. It's talking about, um, you know, the reprobate mind, and they gave themselves over. They served the creature more than the creator. They didn't really serve reality. They didn't serve the genuine. They, served the art of, they, they were serving the artificial. They were serving the genetically modified. And God said he gave them over to reprobate mind. And it says that the women uh, left the natural use and were with other women. Men did the same thing. One translation of this in Romans 125 says, for they exchanged the reality of God for the unreal. So John 14, 6, we know this one. It says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I could say this way. I could say this way. He's the way, the reality, and the life. Because truth and reality are synonymous. It's genuine. It's authentic. It's real. John 16, 13 says, when he, the spirit of truth, or I could say the spirit of reality has come, he will guide us into all reality or all truth. He wants you to be in Christ and have that reality of who you are in that truth, in that reality. Are you with me? The human heart cannot find no reality outside of the man, Jesus Christ. The new creation is real. Our fellowship with the Father is real. Now, I'm going to give you a couple examples from the word of two different people, and then we're going to get into kingdom love. But I want to kind of set the context to get you to buy all in. Because my prayer is when you leave tonight, we just don't have a good message, but we actually apply this to our lives. And any adjustments, any things we, anything we need to correct, anything we need to be in more, let's get there. You need to make the choice. Your friend can't do it for you. Your spouse can't do it for you. You need to choose to be in Christ. Not just legally, but vitally, and walk this thing out to experience God's best and his plan and his pathway for your life. So let's look at the life of Peter first. In Peter, uh, Peter, in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 19, it says this. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, 
the Son of Man am. So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say to you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, in this encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, Peter had the revelation that he was the Messiah. And notice his name was Simon Barjona. But look what Jesus said after he had the revelation that he is the Christ. He said, and your name is Peter. So he changed his name. You know, God is in the business of changing your name and your identity. God is in the business of changing your name and your identity. All of us had a BC life. All of us had a BC life. Jacob in the Old Testament had a name change. His name meant con artist or trickster. But when he had an encounter with God Almighty on the way to Laban's house, God changed his name. He said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob. It should be called Israel, for you have prevailed with God and man. And we don't need to see ourselves as we used to be. We need to see ourselves as God created us to be. I know if I was able to have conversation to people I went to high school with, they would be blown away at me right now, because I am not the same person. And my name among this body is way different than my name and my reputation in high school. And that's a good thing, glory to God. (laughs) And yours should be too, amen? And he gave Peter this revelation and said, you're not gonna be called that anymore, your name is Peter, which means it's a piece of a large rock. You shouldn't be shaken anymore. You shouldn't vacillate anymore. You should be all in with me, united in harmony and concord with me in oneness of mind, purpose, and heart, Peter. I'm calling you who you are because you know who I am. And you're only going to find out who you are when you know who he is. Because our true identity in reality is found in him. Your job doesn't identify who you are. Your bank account doesn't identify who you are. Even your last name doesn't identify who you are. What identifies who you are is in the kingdom of God with the Lord Jesus Christ. So Peter in Luke chapter 22, though, it's interesting when trials, tests, and temptations hit, I find it fascinating that Peter has this revelation in Matthew 16. Jesus tells him who he is. And you would think once we heard it the first time, you would just be in that. You realize you don't always get everything the first time you hear it, right? Or apply it every time that you, get, that you heard it for the first time, second time, third time. It, repetition is important in the learning process. So at the end of Jesus' ministry, Before he's going to the cross, he says this. The Lord said to Peter, he said, Simon, Simon. I find it interesting that he he called him back to the name that he had before he had the revelation that he was Christ the Messiah. He said, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith fail not And when you are converted, strengthen the brethren. When I read this, I thought, why didn't Peter say, Lord, that's not my name? You said it's not Simon. You said it's Peter, a large rock. So he forgot what the Lord said he was supposed to be in. Legally, he's always Peter, but vitally, he reverted back to Simon, Simon. 
And a man without a vision for the future will always return to the past. And we know this from John, because how is the devil going to tempt Peter? We read on. He says that Satan's going to come. He's asked to sift you as wheat. And he said, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. And we find over in John 21 that Peter went back to fishing because a man without a vision for the future always returns to the past. But Jesus prayed for him. He said, I pray that your faith fail not. There is consequential actions for, of sin is guilt. When you miss the mark, you go into shame and hiding. We need to have a soft conscience to the word of God, the truth and reality of the word. Don't ever let your conscience get seared. A seared conscience is an inactive conscience, which means you don't feel any regret for wicked behavior or immoral conduct. And we always want to be soft before the Lord, meaning I always have a heart to repent and get things right. When King David was confronted by the prophet Nathan, he said, I am that man. He didn't pass the buck. He didn't pass the responsibility. He said, I am that man. Soft conscience before God. And I like what Jesus said. He said, when you're converted, strengthen the brethren. So Jesus knew this is going to happen. He was praying for his faith not to fail. You are not out of God's reach, even if you've missed it. But I'm telling you that tonight, you don't have to miss it if you stay in him. The same way that Jesus is praying for Peter, he's interceding on our behalf right now. And he's what he's saying is staying in the truth. Stay in the reality of who you are. Don't deviate. Don't vacillate. Don't compromise to who I've called you to be. In Mark chapter 16, verse number 7, think about how bad Peter felt when he heard that rooster crow the third time. He, he put his head down in shame because he knew he missed it. He knew he blew it. Correct? And he went, he went to hide. He went back to fishing. But look what Jesus said in Mark 16, after Mark 16, 7, after the resurrection. Actually, this is an angel when they went to look in the tomb. And Jesus wasn't there. There was an angel there. And they said, but go tell his disciples and Peter. He's going ahead of you in the galley. There you will see him just as he told you. That was a place where he welcomed Peter back into fellowship with him. Peter probably loved the fact that Jesus singled him out by name to get him, because he probably didn't know his standing with him. He's thinking, I've blown, I've gone too far, I've missed it. Jesus doesn't want me around. But Jesus said, no, I want you back in me. So get back up. The Bible says a just man falls down, but he rises back up. The problem is, is when we miss it, we tend to throw off the wrong things. We throw off prayer. We throw off going to church. We throw off go reading the word. The legal side of forgiveness is it's done by the blood of Christ. The vital side is 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And so Peter was able to repent. You're able to repent. And you're able to get back in fellowship with God Almighty. So that's the good news. The vital side says this of our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. James chapter 4, verse number 8 says, Draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. God's waiting on some of you tonight. Legally, it's been paid. Vitally, you need to make your move and say, I'm coming after you, God. Some people say, where's God? He's never moved. You're the one that got out of position. Get back in position. Just like the parable of the prodigal, we think God's going to hit us with a giant fly swatter and smash us. No, when the di in, the, in the parable of the prodigal, when the, the son was in the pig slop, his attitude changed from give me my inheritance to make me. And when you have that attitude, Lord, just make me. 
just make me. Guess what? The father's arms are wide open. Just like in that parable, they're saying, come on home. He was waiting for him. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. So don't forget who you are. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't forget who you are. Tell them, stay in Christ. Now, this isn't gospel, but this is Coach Boone from Remember the Titans. They're getting ready to get on the bus. And Coach Boone looks at Gary and said, take a good look at her. Because once you get on that bus, you ain't got no mama no more. You got your brothers and you got this team and you got your daddy. Now, who's your daddy? If you want to play on this team, you answer me when I ask you, who's your daddy? Whose team is this, your team or your daddy's team? And God's saying, this is my team. This ain't your team, no selfish ambition, no lost identity, no selfishness, no fake trinity, me, myself, and I. We're all in on the real trinity, the genuine, the real God Almighty, El Shaddai. Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Mekiddush, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Tiskanu, Jehovah Nisi, my victory, hallelujah. Jehovah Shalom, God, my peace. I'm in him. He's Adonai, the total majesty, total authority in my life. He is Jehovah Roha, the one who leads me and guides me and protects me. He is Elohim, the creator and the governor of this universe. And I'm in him. And it's his team. I know who my daddy is. I know who my name is. So Benaiah in the Old Testament knew who he was. In 2 Samuel 23, verses 20 through 22, 2 Samuel 23, verses 20 through 22, it says, Benaiah... This is one of the mighty men of David, was the son of Joadiah, the son of a valiant man from Cabazil, who had done many deeds. He had killed two lion-like heroes of Moab. He had also gone down and killed a lion in the midst of a pit on a snowy day. And he killed an Egyptian, a spectacular man. The Egyptian had a spear in his hand, so he went down him with a staff wrestled the staff, the spear out of the Egyptian's hand, and he killed him with his own spear. These things Benaiah, the son of Joadiah, did and won a name or a reputation among the three mighty men. Although he wasn't part of the three of the chief mighty men, he still had a reputation of the three. And I bring up Benaiah because he never forgot who he was. He was in position. I like what the scripture says about him. It says he was the son of a valiant man, and he knew who he was. He knew whose lineage he was in, and he never lost that position. And so the story should encourage you, don't ever lose the position. Once he began a good work in you, he'll complete it. The thing I like about Daniel is he started right, he stayed right, and he ended right. The thing I like about Benaiah is he started right, he stayed right, and he ended right because he knows he was a son of a valiant man. And listen, we've been adopted into the family of God, and we are the sons and daughters of a valiant king. Valiant means I have strength. I have force. I am a force to be reckoned with no matter where I go. I have a presence about me. I have an atmosphere. It's not me. It's no longer I that live. It's Christ that's in me. When I walk into Walmart, when I'm at the gas station, when I go to Bailey's gym, wherever I am, there I am. I bring all that's within me. The hope of glory, Christ. And Benaiah stayed right. Listen, there's going to be challenges in life. There's going to be tests. There's going to be circumstances. You're not going to tip through, tiptoe through the tulips on a flowery bed of ease in this walk with Christ. 
There's going to be some mountaintop experiences and there's going to be some valley experiences. And thank God for the mountaintop. But things grow in the valley. And Benaiah, his name means Jehovah has built me. His name is built me or he's built me up. And you need to be built in Christ. And if you haven't been built in Christ, start now. Preparation is the evidence you believe something's coming. There was a sign at a, a store, a flower store, one time that a person saw it said the best time to plant a seed was 25 years ago. The second best time is to plant it today. And preparation is the evidence that you believe something's coming. So get built up. You don't wait for trouble to hit. And then say, let me try to get built. You're reactive, not proactive. You get in the word, you stay in the word. The Bible says meditate in the word day and night. Why? So you could be built up. When something comes, Matthew chapter 7, the winds and waves come to all of us. One was not prepared. One was because they started the building project on the rock and they stayed on the rock and in the rock. I like Benaiah, though, because he was all in. That's what I want you to get is to be all in tonight. All in. All in on Christ's realities. All in on truth. All in on his team. All in on who your daddy is. All in on who your identity is in him. And Benaiah, this one thing that he did, this one thing, he had many different feats. But I like this, this part of the story where it said he went into a pit on a snowy day and he killed a lion. I just see Benaiah walking by. And I'm thinking, dude, it's a challenge on a snowy day to get in a pit without a lion <laughs> and try to get Buck out of the pit. But you went in a pit with a lion. That's a bad dude. I mean, you're all in at that point. Because if you don't win, you die. And I just, he just wanted to pick a fight. I think some of us just need to pick a spiritual fight. He wasn't scared. He was not scared. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. And ain't no devil in hell going to take me out, tell me who I am. I'm going to put him where he belongs, under my feet. So Benai went down there and just Annihilated the lion and got out of the pit. That's a bad dude. That's a bad dude. And I like the other story, too, because what the enemy went for bad, no weapon formed to get you so prosper. Just like King David took Goliath's sword, right? Benaiah, in one of his fights, took the other guy's spear, took it out of his hand and just killed him because he knew who he was in Christ. Now turn with me to Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. This is training for reigning and schooling for ruling. Get built up right now. Stay in Christ. So before we read these few verses, I want to give you Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 4, because this is my main takeaway of what I want you to leave with tonight of what to be in for this message. We're going to be in love. Intimately acquainted with love, oneness in mind, purpose in heart. We're going to be in a fixed position of love. If you want to excel and succeed as a believer and a son or daughter of God, you need to be in that position of love. There's a legal side you're going to see, but there's also a vital side of love that we have to walk out. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 says, According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now I'm going to read Romans chapter 5, these several verses, and I'm going to go ahead and explain some of these things. It says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, 
we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Now, legally, when we first start reading this verse, it says we've been justified by faith and we have peace with God. That means we have harmony and concord between God and us because of what Jesus did in redemption legally. So there's peace. I'll put it this way. The war is over. You just surrender and stay in the position of what he's provided legally, and you live that out vitally and stay in peace. It says that we have peace and we have grace in which we can stand. So trials and tribulations are to come. Tests are going to come, just like they came to Beniah, just like they came to Peter. But if you're going to overcome, you got to understand who you have access to and who you belong to. And because of this grace that was poured out in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have access, which means we have approach, or we can come near the throne of God and have a relationship with him. How many people talk to other people about their problems and not to God about their problems? We have access to the throne of heaven. Hebrews 4 says, let us come boldly before the throne of grace to find mercy and grace to help in our time of need. If we could just get quiet, bow down, listen, and come to God Almighty and understand the access we have, we don't have to Google something. Right? You don't have to put on, out on Facebook for advice. You have a father in heaven. Matter of fact, there's a big difference between godly counsel and good advice. And the distances between heaven and hell. Good advice could send you straight to hell. Godly counsel is going to bring heaven to earth. But we have access by grace. And it says in which we stand. That means it's a fixed position. We're in what he's telling us to do. He makes us firm. He makes us established. You can come before his throne. He can give you a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge. He can give you godly counsel for any situation you're going through. And in that, you can stand. And having done all to stand, stand therefore. Don't grow weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap. When you go before the throne and you can listen to daddy, and get his counsel, there's no greater result that you can have in your life if you just follow through with that. And listen to that. I think back to my life. I had to go before the throne in 1997 when I legally got born again, found out about the redemption in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I was asking God, access to the throne, what do you want me to do with my life now? And I just knew on the inside I needed to go to school to get trained. That was access, and I had to stand in that word. And you know what? It seemed right to go to Rama Bible Training Center. I'm in Columbus, Ohio, going to move to Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. Why haven't they fixed it yet? <laughs> so I move way across country, right? But that's the access I had. That's the word I had. And I, was it always easy? Did I feel like quitting at times? Did I miss Ohio? One of the greatest states. <laughs> With four real seasons. Hallelujah. I.O. Thank you. Did I feel like quitting sometimes or getting up? Sure, but I had to stand on that word. And in standing on that word, I finished my course. In standing in that word, I got a godly wife. In standing in that word, I, I met Pastor on Marcy. In standing in that word, we formed a relationship. In standing in that word, they decided they were going to come start a church. We went back to the throne of grace now that I'm married to Angie at the time and said, Lord, what do you want us to do? 
Now, when they first told us they're coming to Florida, we prayed. You know what the Lord said? Don't go. He said, you did the first year of marriage, you just need to enjoy it. Settle in. It's the merge. You know, you get to learn each other the first year of marriage, right? Hallelujah. Which way to put the toilet paper, over or under? Don't leave the toilet seat up. Right? Don't leave dirty underwear and dirty stuff all over the floor. Be a blessing, not a curse. So the first year he said, just get to know each other, invest in the marriage. That was the word we got. Now, Pastor Aaron and Marcy actually came to Florida. They stayed for a little bit. Then they ended up going back and being youth pastors in Sand Springs for several years. Then they told us the second time we, that they were going. We prayed about it again. We went to the throne. We got access. And the Holy Spirit said, what? He released and said, go with them. And that's where we've been ever since 2004 when we moved uh, to Florida. But we have anybody can have access to the throne. Are you running to your Father in heaven? He cares about you. He has the best plans for you. He's always working for your highest benefit. Love, agape love is always working for the highest benefit of the one loved. And you can always go to the throne. David, I like reading some of the Psalms today. He said, why is my soul downcast? Why am I going through it? But there's always resolve that he found in his relationship with God. And those Psalms change if you read them. All of a sudden, he gets to rejoice in where he was sad just a few minutes ago because he got in access with God and he got a word in due season. So you want to have access so you can stand to overcome anything that or any obstacle that comes your way. And it, it, reads, it uh, reads on like this. It says, rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. I'm going to read that again. We glory in tribulations. The word glory means we rejoice. We boast about it. We say, bring it on. Is that all you got? It's kind of like Benaiah walking by the lion. And he's like, dude, I'll take you out. I got a great God. I've killed some men, but now I'm going to go after something more intimidating because I want to be a giant slayer. I heard about King David doing it, so let me do a great exploit. Daniel eleven thirty two says, those that know their God shall be strong and do great exploits. So we, we glory or we boast in tribulation. Tribulation means this. It's a, pr a pressing together. It's a pressure. It's an affliction. It's a distress. I've learned this in lifting weights. There is no progress without resistance. Matter of fact, they call it a progressive resistant training because you can develop when pressure comes. You know, Paul over in 2 Corinthians, he was praying one time. He said, Lord, remove this thing from me. He said, I sought the Lord three times on that. God said, ain't going to do it. He said, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. And Paul said, I'd rather glory in tribulation that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now, you need to, what, you need to know what to take authority on and put down now and what you're just going to walk through by the grace of God. Sickness, you take authority over now. But there could be somebody at your work that's really pestering you, bugging you, giving you a hard time, making you just want to slap them upside the head. And God said, my grace is sufficient for you. Just stay in love. <laughs> stay in a position of love and you'll overcome. So we glory in tribulation because when we go through it right and stay in him, tribulation is going to work patience. This translation says perseverance. That means we're going to learn how to be steadfast and we're going to learn how to have endurance. This life is not a sprint. It's a marathon. So you have to have endurance built in. There's sometimes you walk, sometimes you run, sometimes you may feel like you're crawling, but you're always moving forward. And we need to learn how to have patience or perseverance. And what happens with when you learn to have patience or perseverance? It means that you're going to go ahead and get character or experience. And that means that you're approved. You're a specimen of worth. I want to be around somebody who's overcome something. 
I'm not going to get advice some, to somebody whose marriage is failing and been divorced five times. I want to go to, some, to somebody that's walked through some things and overcame them because they stayed in Christ and now they have heaven on earth. Right? I want to say, what did you do so I could reproduce that? But they went through some pressure, some affliction, but they learned how to be steadfast. They learned how to be committed. They learned how to be bound to a course of action. And because of that, their character started to shine forth. And God puts no unproven character on his market. He wants to see the church rise up and see men and women be men and women of godly character and Christ likeness. Flow in the gifts of the spirit, but also walk in the fruits of the spirit. And out of that experience or out of that character comes hope because you learn that God's always going to come through. The legal side, you've heard about it, but the vital side is when you're actually walking it out and you start to get, go through a test but becomes a testimony and you, you do, you're just like Sarah, you could look back on the faithfulness of God and say, God did it for me before, he's going to do it for me again. I just need to stay in him. And you know what Paul says at the end of this these five verses, he said, hope makes not a shame. That means I'll never be dishonored or disgraced if I stay in Christ. Because the love of God's been shed abroad in my heart. The agape love of God is in our heart. Legally, it's there, but vitally, you need to walk it out every day. So I want to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8. This is the great love chapter. I'm going to read these four verses from three different translations, and I just want this to settle in on you because the love of God's been poured out in our heart by the Holy Ghost. We can always overcome if we stay in that love, not just legally, but vitally exercising it every day. So the New King James Version reads, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8 is this, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not pray to itself. It is not puffed up. It, it does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. Love thinks no evil. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things. It endures all things. Love never fails. The Message Bible says it like this. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than it does for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. A child will throw a temper tantrum if they don't get what they want right then. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut. It doesn't have a swelled head. Love doesn't force itself on others. Love isn't always me first. Love does not fly off the handle. Love doesn't keep the score of sins of others. Love doesn't revel when others grovel. Love takes pleasure in the flowering of truth. Love puts up with anything. Glory to God. One, one translation says love passes the breaking point without breaking. So when it says love could put up with anything, in your flesh you can't do it, church. But in his love, you could both say, I'm going to come through this glory to God. This is just strengthening my love muscle right now. Just flex, baby. I'm getting stronger. Maybe we need a rocky thing, getting stronger in love as we exercise it vitally, right? So it'll put up with anything. It trusts God always. Love always looks for the best. It never looks back, but keeps going to the end. The J.B. Phillips translation says it like this. The love of which I speak is slow to lose patience. It looks for a way of being constructive. It's not possessive. It is neither anxious to impress, nor does it cherish inflated ideas of its own importance. Love has good manners and does not pursue selfish advantage. Love is not touchy. It does not keep account of evil or gloat over the wickedness of other people. On the contrary, it is glad with all good men when truth prevails. 
Love knows no limits to its endurance, no end to its trust, no fading of its hope. It can outlast anything. It is, in fact, the one thing that still stands when all else has fallen. And I'm going to close with this. Worship team, you can come. Love never fails. Nobody sets out to be a loser. Let me say it again. Your goal in life, nobody says, I'm going to be a loser. The one thing that will guarantee your success, church, is staying in love.